Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 191. And Merry Christmas to all who celebrate, and thank you for following along for another year of amazing stories from interesting people. I have a Christmas present for you all. This episode is with my new friend, Tom O'Connell, who not only is an incredible actor and stunt performer, he's also one of the most genuine and hardworking people I've ever met. In this episode, we talk about him being from Kentucky, growing up playing sports, how he got into acting, the importance of being present, getting into stunts, fighting through tough days on set, getting the call to double Darth Vader in Obi-Wan Kenobi, and so much more. I am so excited for you all to get to know Tom, and I wish you all the best in the coming year. So let's end this year on a high note. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 191, with Tom O'Connell. Theme song time. are you today i'm in los angeles i'm in north hollywood right now nice back home oh yeah well well yeah yeah we're, we're i'm at home she's uh she's filming right now actually so oh, right on where's she at uh she's actually strangely enough in my hometown in louisville kentucky oh what you're from kentucky i am i'm a kentucky boy okay okay i don't think i've been to kentucky i'm trying to think i've been a, i've been like to all the states around it i'm originally from north carolina which isn't super yes, far yes. No, no, it's not bad at all. Dumb question. Have you been to the Derby? Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, if you if you go to Kentucky, now you can go that weekend, which it, it's it's like a two week of lead up. And so yeah. it's a fun time to be in Louisville. But um, if you go during that time, just prepare for a bit of madness. And, and yeah. it's, not, <laughs> it's not it's not like the usual par for the course, but it is pretty wild. Like everybody gets into it pretty good. Is it do you have you been to that specific track when the derby isn't going on? Yes. Yeah. Is it weird? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's I actually think it's it's better. I mean, I, I don't mind oh, large yeah, crowds. I'm kind of like a 50-50 guy. Like I'm an introverted extrovert or an extroverted introvert. Same, same. But like I like to every now and then it's just cool to be in like an energized crowd. You know, it could be a totally football game or baseball what you know whatever sport you want to fill in the blank with but like there's something about that like crowd energy that just yeah you know, it's it, it's kind of i think it's unfortunate if you're going to rob yourself of that you know like as a human like that's something you want to experience at least once i totally agree i'm i'm very i kind of attack life that way just in general of like if i haven't experienced it i kind of want to that is a great way to attack life i think you know, it's I don't like, know why I said attack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have to attack life, but sometimes you have to, Tom. Life's going to attack you. You gotta get <laughs> Yeah, to you it. gotta fight back. Don't <laughs> yeah. let it win. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it one of those things growing up around a derby that just by proximity you're into like horse racing? You know what's funny is like they're <sighs> I, I don't want to go Debbie Downer, but like, you know, horse, sure. horse racing is kind of nefarious at times. Like, totally. you know, there's, there's doping scandals and all mm -hmm. kinds of weird stuff that goes on. And you think about the life of the animal and you're like, well, I don't know. I mean, it's sure. great, great for the studs and I guess that win, but like sure. <laughs> what happens to the other guys, but you know, it's, it's, it, I, I just kind of appreciate it. That moment and that race and that, culture for what it is um sure. there's a lot of history there so i i like it for that and i like it for those reasons you know i mean you could there's good and bad with everything right so it's it's totally. about finding the balance and i'm sticking right here on the positive side yeah <laughs> the brian balance of it all <laughs> <laughs> it's compulsion at this point to have a, a name that's a pun it's it, it, you gotta love it and hate it yeah. <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> so did you did you grow up riding horses no, I did not. That was something that came very much later in life for me. <laughs> Interesting, because I've seen some some uh, some pictures of you falling off of horses. <laughs> that and usually happens, you yeah. want to do that when you're younger and more Tupperware like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you very much do. Yeah, I um I came to it very late in life, and um, it was one of those things where I was just like seeking out new hobbies, basically. Sure. And it was kind of like what you said earlier. You know, it's like. You, you, you see something you haven't done before and you're like, yeah, I'll give that a shot. 
and somebody invited me to go and I absolutely fell in love with it. I fell in love with the the process. I fell in love with the presence you have to have. And um, there's probably a reoccurring theme there, but like if you, when you fall off, it's generally because you're too much in your own head or you're trying to do something that's out of sync with what the horse is doing. Oh, And so it's, there, there's a presence there that you find with, as you probably, as you well know, with acting or with um, a lot of other activities, you know, I mean, some people would just say meditation, but I think a lot of things can be meditative. Yeah. And that is one of those things where like, if you're not there, the other being, the other heartbeat, the other brain that's involved knows it <laughs> and they will let you know that they know it. So um, to me, that's, that's when things happen on horses is when you're not there with them. Dude, I love that. It's being present. Yes. I've never thought about it that way, but it makes total sense because it's a living being right there mm -hmm. and you're moving in tandem. Yes. So if you're not in sync, interesting. I've never seen horse riding like that. I like that, Tom. Not bad. It's, it's, uh, hey, I'm an amateur philosopher, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong, of course. Somebody well, well versed in horses would be like, no, no, completely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's that's about my... your heels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep your heels down. No, uh, no. But I mean, that's my amateur take on it is, is the presence involved definitely informs the experience. I love that. So then what kind of stuff were you into growing up? Uh, everything. You know, yeah. I, I was a bit of a, I don't want to say like I, I was in that generation right before Ritalin became a thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like there were a few kids in my class that were like on Ritalin and, you know, it was like a thing that that was very much on the outskirts. And then you get to college and it was like everybody was taking some sort of ADHD drug to, to sure. get through. But, um, you know, I, I never experienced that. So I was just like a hyper kid. And so yeah. I would I had I, I grew up with. Uh, a very large Catholic family. And so nice. it was a blessing in that, you know, I, I had a lot of cousins and a lot of uh, sort of built in playmates, let's say like when, when the neighborhood kids weren't around or my sisters were busy, it was like, I could always fall back on someone. And when not, I would just, my imagination would flourish. You know, I'd go out in the yard and play by myself. Yeah. And so I was into a lot of different things, mostly sports. Uh, I would say though, is cool. The more, the more, the more structured environment. Would you play? My, my, well, let me first just say my parents are saints. My mom, especially like it was a very traditional household. And like mm -hmm. in school, it was very, I was very much like a seasonal athlete. So in the fall, it was football or uh, sure. in, in the winter, it was basketball in the spring. It was soccer and summer. It was baseball. And, you know, the loop restarted every year in the fall. Right. And I mean, I, I don't remember like from maybe like fifth grade, I guess, or or maybe even before that fourth grade, it's flag football or whatever it is, whatever it's called now. Mm -hmm. But but it was pretty much that like since I was a little kid, I was all the way through and into high school. I was playing sports in that regard. Really? And I just can't imagine like <laughs> I have a hard time managing myself and my <laughs> dogs. It's like my my parents, God bless them, dealing with four kids and four different Ooh. schedules on top of their own. I, I just can't fathom it. It's, it's crazy to me. Sheesh. Where are you in the four? Uh, I'm second. I'm, I'm a middle child through and through and the only boy, uh, uh oh, three, man. three sisters. Yeah. It is a Catholic family. Yes. Yes. It very much <laughs> is. Uh, and then that's not even the half of it. Like, um, the, the cousins I have in my generation, there's 15 of us on each, on each side. <laughs> Good for you. So, Yeah. Yeah, the family is big, big and strong. Did it even the odds at all? Any other boys or cousins? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, my mom's older sister had five boys and no girls. Oh man, <laughs> her <laughs> her younger sister had three boys and one girl, and then her brother had one girl and one boy. So she actually had the very same same family structure. My dad had, was one of seven. Nice. So <laughs> it, it, it's, we span, we got, we got, uh, we have numbers. If there's a, if there's a clan war we're, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of sports. Like were you, were your parents ever home? Were you ever home? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, that's why I say like, I, it must've been just a constant car carpool shuffle. Uh, yeah. Dude, just stay but... at school. Get like yeah. a cot in the auditorium. Yeah, no, they 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 really are saints, and and juggling that many schedules is crazy to me. But yeah, we my dad worked um, pretty standard. You know, he he worked uh, his job, and my mom was very typically, um, or at least classically, I would say, I wouldn't say typically, but um, you know, she was a stay at home mom for for most of us growing up. She eventually went right back on. and started teaching again. She was a school teacher. Cool. 
until she retired. Um, and so she was mostly just, just kind of going nuts, strangling us. And again, God bless her for that. I, I don't know how she did it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're doing that. So I'm, I'm kind of seeing a thread. I do notice that a lot of people who get into stunts uh, also come from like an athletic background, but mm-hmm. like where, where does your interest in entertainment start? Is that that sports aspect? Because there is a performance side to that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a little bit of it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I think it was a bit of a perfect storm that sort yeah. of led me to where I am and and led me to on that journey. Um, sure. I know you did your research, so I don't think I'm spoiling it. But I went to college. <laughs> I actually went to college um, for an engineering degree. One of these things is not like the other, Tom. It's exactly right. And <laughs> I went with the intention of becoming an astronaut. Dude, and uh, no big deal. As you do. No big deal. <laughs> but uh, there, there's a lot of roadblocks that propped up in my way along along that path. But getting back to it, I, you know, the sports, I just like being an active person. Um, sure. Much. I was always a kid who I would get frustrated when everybody was like watching the football game and I'd be like, who wants to go outside and play? Yes. And, you know, who wants to go play football or who wants to go play baseball or whatever? Like, I just didn't have the attention span to sit there and watch somebody else do it. Totally. And so that really led me into that active lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And then the the path to performing was a little bit different. Like, as you can well imagine, sitting at, uh, at an engineering job desk, just didn't, yeah. <laughs> it didn't suit me well. Like I got very, um, again, it was almost the adult ADHD. It was just, I, c- I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, and so on a whim, I, I went out for a, a buddy of mine was doing improv comedy. And it was this local improv comedy group in Huntsville, Alabama, very small town, Alabama, that was doing like corporate shows. And they would do kind of a weekly show at this like artist loft place on Friday nights. And it was cool. It was like a BYOB. So it was just like something alternatively to do in that small town. Yeah, a little fun. And so I kind of had an itch. So I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And I was awful at first. It was, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know that I was ever great, but I was awful at first for sure. Relatable. But, um, but it was, it was very game. It was called game based improv. So it wasn't like the long form stuff that a lot of the like upright citizens brigade or groundlings or any of those type, you know, it was sure. skit based. In other words, it was like, it was very much like uh, the Drew Carey show, the whose line is it anyway? Right. Give me a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It was very like one liners and very punchliney, which it worked for the, for the audiences that we were catering to. But, uh, but it was a, that was sort of the beginning, the beginning of the path, let's say. Yeah. It makes sense. You can't go back after you get a laugh. No, just can't. It's, it's very, very hard. Once you feel that uh, it's just scratched, you're like, man, I can't, I'm bitten. <laughs> yeah. You're like, is this what Ritalin feels like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll say this now, getting back to, as I said earlier, like to me, it's a presence thing. And if there's anything I'm addicted to in life that I can fully admit that I'm addicted to, it's, it's that it's, it's that feeling of nowness because in improv and acting and stunts and horse riding, yes. and any of that stuff. And I, and I think this is true for athletics too, right? Like you have to keep your attention outside of yourself mm-hmm. to really do well. And the minute you start overthinking things or second guessing or hesitating, you know, again, as true as it is in sports, it is in horse riding it is in acting right like totally you don't want to see that on on screen or whatever unless it's part of the character but you don't yeah. want to see that self-awareness and i think you know again it's it's meditative it's it's something where you can put your focus somewhere else fully and when you get into that sort of flow state as people call it like it's just man when you come back out of it you're like holy did i just wake up from a dream and it yeah. feels good right it feels really good so that's that itch that I think was scratched. And it was like, Oh man, this is so cool. Like this is something that when I immerse myself fully, when did I give it full attention? Like people respond. And that was really, really cool to feel that. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. It's one of those things, like no matter what you're going through in life, when you're on set and you're working, it's like none of that other stuff exists. Right. Exactly. It's magic. It's really cool. I'm a big fan. Yeah. I think (laughs) just anecdotally, like I would probably frustrate some people when I, when I do have longer days on set, like I will leave my phone behind. I don't like, same. (laughs) I don't like that thing where it's like, I pop off to the side and then I respond to text messages in the real world. And that's not dissing anybody because there are certainly extremely talented performers out there that can do both. Totally. I liked the immersion of like being fully involved and listening to the discussions that were going on around me. And, you know, putting myself into the work to that level. Because again, it's that, it's that presence. It's that, 
like, I don't want to deal with the outside stuff right now. I just want to stay immersed in what I'm doing. Yes. And you get what you give. You know, the more that you put into it, the more you learn, the more you grow. And then it, yes. it stacks up. That's how this works. Absolutely. Do you do you actually speak German? <laughs> oh lord no, no, oh. no i no i don't maybe famously poorly i <laughs> somewhat infamously poorly i i, I speak german uh i told you i'll, I'll, I'll let you segue because i I'll, i want to hear this lead up <laughs> i got you comfortable uh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how did you get involved with the last days and more importantly how did you not get heat stroke in that uniform Oh, we did. Don't worry about that. We definitely did. So, so as I said, I, I was involved with this improv troupe and I think this was about 2003 ish. I want to say, mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, once you're bitten by the acting bug, it's like, you, you, you're oh, it's over. Bug, let's say it's over. Like you want to do everything. And it was very much a sense of like drinking from the fire hose. So I was like working my desk job during the day, but like on lunch and sometimes not on lunch, I'd be like looking through like Craigslist casting calls. And yes. I mean, you got to remember I'm in oh, like, yeah. rur I'm in rural Alabama. I'm sure you can identify being in Florida, but like, it's not, you know, even Louisiana at that time. And now Atlanta didn't have a, a film scene at all. There was nothing except Hollywood and New York. Yep. And so a couple of events came to pass. I I did the improv thing and I was invited to start doing some local theater. And it was, this is not, again, I'm not talking trash because the, God bless the fact that there are local theaters that do stuff yes. for, for local people, local artists to participate in. But mm -hmm. this was very much like, I want to say like canned theater. It was like, you know, sure. I think the first play I did was like the best little whorehouse in Texas and like, amazing <laughs> or mu musical, I should say. But like, it was very much that stuff like that's been done a lot, but sure. you know, local folks, it, it just brings exposure. So again, God bless them for doing it. Mm -hmm. But um, from that, I I met an acting coach that had somehow gotten himself to Alabama. He was originally from New York. Oh, cool. And so I started training with him and then it, that just, you know, it furthered the itch. And then I ended up on one of these casting notices were for, was for a film in Birmingham, Alabama choice. And it was for the last days. And it was a this, this unbeknownst to me at the time, I didn't I didn't have HBO at the time, but this was on the heels of Band of Brothers, and it was extremely similar to Band of Brothers. Makes sense. But sort of a let's call it an epilogue or a different chapter, right, of the story. Mm -hmm. And so myself and my buddy Matt, who was also in that improv troupe, uh, who introduced me to the improv troupe, and a couple other guys who were just like, we want to be actors. We drove down, you know, it's an hour and a half drive down to Birmingham, and we went to like a public library, I think, where the auditions were held. Amazing. And uh, a couple of local filmmakers there, a guy named Eric Bryant was the director and writer. Um, we all we all auditioned for this film. And Matt and myself got in. And uh, I didn't audition to play a German, but uh, <laughs> I, I got that role and was later reminded by a good friend of mine, Barry Battles, who was also in the film, that uh, you're, you're, you're out of the box. You look like one. <laughs> so, uh, you know, which makes sense. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, brownish, blondish hair and blue eyes. You know, people mm -hmm. were just like, yeah, that, that looks like a, like a Nazi I believe officer. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I was tasked with that part. And it was funny because I, as I said, I do not know German. And um, they gave me a CD with all of the lines recorded. And the hardest Ooh. part, it, it was easy enough. Like I'm, de I, I used to do pretty decent at, at, you know, accents and impressions. Sure. And just for kicks, you know, with the guys and stuff. And so getting the CD, I was like, okay, I think I can handle like the phonetics. And that's how I learned. I just learned it phonetically. I was like, okay, I'm just going to imitate what the line is and then add the emotion like sort of in the moment with an understanding of what the scene is. There you go. And um, <laughs> the, the tricky part was later we found out, I think the first screening, there was somebody in the audience who was either of German descent or new German. Oh, no. very well, I was like, did you know what you were saying? And I was like, no, I don't. And he was like, yeah, that was not a hundred percent correct oh, no. <laughs> German. So I don't know if they used whatever Google translate, if, if that even existed back then, or if they had just hired somebody, but you know, and, and that's, you know, that's the the foibles of small filmmaking is you, oh, don't yeah. have a, you don't have a budget to go hire a German <laughs> translator or anything. It was just, you know, it was for kicks and to anybody else, they they wouldn't have, they probably wouldn't have known. But uh, right. for, for, for me and us later hearing that, we were like, oh, shucks, we messed up there. But <laughs> oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that was a thing. <laughs> so you're also dying of heat as well as trying your best German impression. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We, Not we, a bad filmed gig. All, we filmed all outdoors and Eric had, had the one thing he definitely did right is he got a costume um, 
you know, his costumes were period appropriate. Yeah, it looked good. And uh, so it was, it, it was from like a surplus store or something. But anyway, it was heavy wool suited officers, <laughs> German oh. officers. And so we we're hiking through like the the heat of summer in Alabama on this guy's farm. And uh, we would do like tick checks every time we, you know, would do a new phone oh, yes. setup or whatever. Uh huh. It was it was it was miserable, but it was as close to being in a warlike scenario as you can imagine. Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I mean, truthfully, you know, your your friends from the foxhole, right? It's like I still am friends with Griffin Hood, who was in that film. Barry Battles, who was in that film. Yeah. Uh, Brad Roller, who was in that film. Like a lot of the guys who suffered with us in that Alabama heat. Like I'm still friends with those guys to this day, and a lot of us have had the pleasure to work together um, after the fact and still work together. So it's been a really that that I will never trade that experience as as sort of I you can say as miserable as it was, but I don't even look back at it that way because it was just so much fun. Yeah, and like those are the moments when you realize like this is what you really want to do. Oh yeah. Even under those conditions, you're like, this doesn't deter me at all. You're like, that's what I'm talking about. And I always like to say like the, the fun stuff, like, yeah, you know, at the highest highs, like those are good stories, but the stuff where things go wrong, like that's, that's always the better stories to me. 100%. Like that's always where people have the most fun retelling the story. Cause you shared that, that what at the time was sort of quote unquote miserable like <laughs> we all yes. sort of laugh about it after the fact, right? Totally. And in life, I always say that if things go wrong, it makes a better story. Absolutely. Very true. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear like, and then it worked out. You're like, oh, okay, <laughs> I guess. Not much of a payout, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But exactly. if someone's like, the horse died in between the reshoots, you're like, you did what? You did that's, what? <laughs> that's a story. You yeah, know? that's a story. That's correct. So then what would you say was more difficult? You've got the heat in the wool uniforms on a farm for the last days but in no way out you're kind of by yourself just freaking out yeah it's like that there's an emotional there's a there's a lot of heavy emotion in that one like how was that shot i don't know how you, how you find this stuff <laughs> um, you, you've heard of my research mr o'connell i i have yeah yeah i did i did some research too oh um, my man <laughs> a lot of good buddies on this show so i was it was a pleasure to listen to their interviews um I appreciate you. Yeah, the the No Way Out was a student film that was done at Chapman University. And at this time, just, you know, people probably, I would imagine the, the intro would include the fact that I'm a stunt performer, or at least predominantly known for that now. But at the time, I was pursuing acting fully. Like, I didn't have a concept of what stunts was. Oh, interesting. At least not, not professionally. I, I was purely pursuing acting. And mm -hmm. I think m m myself and Griffin Hood, who I already mentioned, we were mm -hmm. roommates in Los Angeles in Studio City. And um, it was funny, like, I don't even think I had a car at that time. Like I borrow his car to go to auditions. <laughs> you are an actor. And, um, yeah, it was, it was for real <laughs> acting. Yeah, just short of living on, out of my car. Yep. <laughs> um, we uh, So I, I had borrowed his car and it was a longer drive from Studio City to Chapman University is in Downey. It's about a 45 minute drive or so. And I had gone down and I was doing everything like I, I don't necessarily know. I mean, again, I sort of live my life with no regrets, but at the, I don't know that it was a, the smartest business approach to acting, but I was just doing everything. Any audition I got, I would go to it, you know? Uh, same, same, same. Um, so this was for a student film and, and I went down to Chapman and I distinctly remember like it was one of those auditions where, where, you know, you'll hear actors say like, I was just so desperate at that point. Mm -hmm. And I did. I felt like I was so desperate at that point. I was like, I just like, just go for it, man. Like, don't even, yeah. don't censor yourself. Don't limit yourself. Just go 110% into this and we'll see what happens. Like the worst case that happens is a student film and like, you don't get it and who cares? Like you're not getting paid anyway. So like, just exactly. do it. And so I just sort of went for it. And, and the guy that uh, directed it, he, uh, he cast me and then, we shot on a soundstage that I guess is part of the university or a warehouse like structure. Oh, cool. But it really was. It was just dark, me in the the spotlight and you know, a few crew members kind of whispering around. And you know, when you're in the lights, like you can hardly see. Yeah. And I and to be honest, like again, I was pretty green at this point. So like I didn't know what to do or what to expect. I was just like, just know your lines and show up and try to do the best you can and take direction, you know? And um, yeah. You know, it was it was a fun experience. Like I said, I I I don't know that it'll win me an Oscar or anything, but it was always <laughs> it's always fun to like work on your talent and yes, to, to do that on somebody else's project. I mean, I I owe them. I, I look at it the other way around. I, I owe them because they gave me the opportunity to work on that. So that was great. 
Yeah, dude, I I feel like we kind of see things the same way a lot. I think so, too. I kind of view acting as like, I was talking to somebody about this recently. I view acting as like a blue collar creative job where like in the meantime, I try and get as good as I can at the skills so that I can be as of service as possible to help someone bring their idea. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think I think you brought something up. I was listening to the interview with Stephen O. Young, our mutual oh, friend. Love that guy. <laughs> Lovely human being. So handsome. I hate him for he it. He is. I, I tell him all the time. I'm like, he <laughs> says it to me, and I'm like, come on, man. I mean, don't, don't do that. Come on. I'm not going to pick you two against each other, but... Yeah. He's, he's, a hands, he's a handsome man himself. So I, 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 uh, as are you, pal. We were, but, but I, I remember something you said in the interview there or with him, or he, he said to you perhaps, but you know, this, this attitude of like being grateful for the opportunity to work on it and, yeah. and to give ideas and, and get feedback. And, you know, sometimes, you know, as a, as a new performer, I'll say, I think he said it's something about, um, coming up as a kid actor. He he wished sometimes that he had come up as a kid actor. Mm -hmm. And, and I think the difference that I'm starting to notice is like the time span, like to get good quote unquote at acting or performing is it's a long game. Yeah. And the reason I think so many actors that are, you know, quite good now, they've been doing it for a very long time. And it's mm -hmm. not fair to sort of compare yourself to say like, hey, I could compare to myself to somebody that's in the same age bracket, but they've been doing this for such a long time. Yes. And I think at least a small component of that is the experience factor, but also the confidence of like, you know, when to take chances and when not to, and when, when things will be impactful and when they won't. But a lot of that just comes from the confidence of saying, I've done this enough. And what might be really cool in this moment is, you know, X, Y, Z. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something that I think comes with, with experience and time. And again, I, just to bring it back, like, I feel very grateful for getting the opportunity to do this at all. I mean, there's, yeah. there's the, the opportunity that anybody casts you at any given time is, is not to be looked down upon <laughs> Sure, not in my book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. I when I learned like just the amount of steps behind the scenes it takes to get an audition mm -hmm. was like, oh wow, yeah, I need to celebrate every single audition. Oh yeah. And then if you get the job, that's like the prize at the end. But the the real celebration's like, oh, I get to audition for this thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just changing the mindset, you know what I mean? Have you have you ever um produced or or shot your own films? I have. Um to a degree. I had that Western that I made yeah, called Blisters. blisters. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Tom, you know what Blisters is. Uh, hey, Tom. I did my homework. I'm telling you. <laughs> my man. Yeah. Blisters, uh, I wrote it and we actually, we shot it twice because mm. the, the first time that we shot it, uh, I was just like, oh, uh, let's just get this done. And I just grabbed random people that I knew who'd never worked on anything. I was like, you just hold the mic and then like you say action, you run the camera. Everything went wrong. It was absolutely terrible. I love it. I love it. This is the, so. So sometime you you really should talk to uh, Barry Battles. He's a great friend of mine. He's oh, also I'd love a to. roommate of mine over the years. Director, writer. Um. So so Barry and Griffin, my other one of my other best friends, I think in this world. Uh, mm -hmm. Also Griffin, I just mentioned. We, Baytown uh, boys. Yeah, the Baytown boys. We all stuck mm -hmm. together after that. That that's what I when I get back to that very first project, like we we stuck together after that. And we all thought like, hey, this is something we all really want to pursue. Like, let's just start making stuff for kicks. And we did. And they it, we always said it like our film school was those short films we did that yes, in backwoods, Alabama at Barry's house that you know a handful of people have watched and even less probably appreciated, but like <laughs> But it's we had such me. a good time. We had such a good time making them that that's really what I think was more of the the bug than anything else was like, wait a minute, I can do this and have such a good time doing it and do it with my friends. And yeah. God, God willing, you actually someday might make money at it. Like that's a thing. Right. You know, like it, once we sort of had that impression of what we could do, that really is what I think was like a hard shift in like what a career path could be. Totally. And it's like, like you said, that's your, that's your schooling, right? Like I see all these things as yeah. well as like my acting school is being on set, figuring this stuff out. Yeah. You know, cause you learn by doing, oh, that didn't work. That, that worked really well. I got to remember that. Yeah. And you push yourself, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Speaking of the Baytown disco, 
please do. <laughs> was the mohawk your idea? Because you actually it was, it, it wasn't. Well. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, did, did it take convincing? <laughs> no, not at all. I okay, again, I you have to remember, I was in desperation mode. No, right? Yeah, <laughs> I would have done, done. I would have done anything at that point, and I and I sort of did. But like we would do it, we would have done just about anything. And, and <laughs> the number of stories we could tell again about the hard times and and what now we look back fondly on it. But sure, Barry. Um, just to give the background to anybody uninitiated, Barry Battles and Griffin Hood wrote a script. Um, the script was birthed out of a uh, a, a, sh- a small film festival that was actually in Florida. It was at the Delray oh, Beach right Film Festival. Yeah, right on. Um, so right near, right near your neighborhood. Um, yeah. So they had we we had started with a film that Barry and Griffin had did called Misdirection, and it was it not although it misdirection in the magician sense. Um, mm-hmm. It it was spelled Mister X X T N M R period E X T I O N. And Boom. people, the number of people that got that wrong was kind of crazy to us. But anyway, it, it was a short film about making a film, which as you is, do, as you do. And, and in a lot of circles is considered the biggest grown of them all. Right. But <laughs> but we, we made a funny, it. we made a funny little thing and, and the, it went to a lot of film festivals and they were invited back a year later cool. and they were involved in something called a script to screen competition, which was like one script was taken by five, I think teams of previous year winners Oh. And they were they were all to put their own take on it, right? Kind of like a, a scramble, like um, the 24-hour film competition. Yeah. And Barry and Griffin and another buddy of mine, Billy McDaniel, all went down there. This is I was in New York at the time trying to learn some acting. And uh, they went down there and filmed this completely off the rails version of the script. Oh. That was very loosely based on the script that was given to them. And that ultimately was called the Baytown Disco. Oh, okay. And it had enough um, audience response that it won won the award. And then they kind of came back thinking like, well, we can keep making short films for, you know, pats on the back and applause at film festivals, or we can try to write a feature. And so all of us kind of got together on the phone and we're like, hey, if you guys can can write, then you know, I, with my college learning (laughs) and uh, (laughs) I'll try to produce this thing. And so we started out on this path of like what we thought was going to be Barry and Griffin wrote a script and I would produce it and we would get credit cards and run ourselves into debt. And, you know, we had just all read the, the Robert, Robert Rodriguez book, Uh Rebel Rebel Without a Crew. crew. Uh And so we all thought like, yeah, we're going to run ourselves into credit card debt and we're going to make this movie and we're going to take it to Sundance (laughs) and it's going to be this thing. Yeah. And so that was the intention, but we knew just enough to be dangerous. And in that, what I mean is we knew just enough to say, we need a name talent to come in. Mm-hmm. and be our be our lead so that we can get investment money because we can't smart you know, we need something to sell this movie other than just random guys in alabama right and so we called upon another random guy in alabama or from alabama anyway clean crawford beautiful and uh Clayne was our he was going to be our a name talent you know at that time in his career he was looking to break into leading man roles he had done a lot of like best friend roles and he had a good mm-hmm. arc on 24 and all that kind of stuff and so we presented the script to him and he took it and said, Hey, you know, this is, this is cool. Like I'm going to run this by my agent. And when he did that, that sort of opened the floodgates. And oh. another thing that you talked about with both Steven and, and another guy, Ross, that you talked to Love Ross, <laughs> Ross Conson is luck and timing. And yes, the luck of it was Clayne took it to his agent. His agent loved it and was like, this is really cool. Who are these guys? Are they represented? And so Barry and Griffin then went on this whirlwind tour of like meeting with agencies and studios. And you want to talk about like chapter two of your film education. Like we had been so focused on what I like to call the show of it. Yeah. We didn't know anything about the business of it. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, we had regional agents and this, that and the other, but we had no idea what it took to get a film from script to screen. Sure. And so it became a multi-year journey. But eventually, yes, we produced the Baytown uh, what what we did is they they went on like this six month tour where they talked to everyone in Hollywood. It seemed like and and it was so cool. Like every time it was like a notch on the belt of like oh we went into Fox or oh we went into Sony or whatever. Cool. And it was just fun to like be invited to sit at the table. Yeah, you know you're onto something. The problem was at the end of that you're looking at 
I think it was like 2009, 2010, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And during that time frame, you have to remember, like the economic climate was not particularly good in the United States. Right. It was kind of high, whatever. And so like investment money was not like readily available or as readily available as it is in other times. And and sure. even in other times, film is, films are a hard sell. Mm-hmm. So, and and if you know the Baytown Outlaws or the Baytown, the Baytown Disc or that what it became the Baytown Outlaws, it it's an action movie. And it's wild. Independent action movies are even more rare to come by. Right. <laughs> so um, so investors were not exactly like super keen to jump on board. And so after six months in Hollywood, Griffin and Barry went back to Alabama and we were all just kind of like shrugging our shoulders. Like what happened? Like it didn't, it's not going to get made now. Yeah. And so Barry will tell the story better than I ever could, but I was driving down to Florida where, where my grandparents had a condo in Destin. Perfect. And I stopped by his house in uh, Oxford, Alabama. And I said, Barry, I was like, don't you remember like how we started this? Like we were just going to do it ourselves. Like what if we just go back to that and do it ourselves? Like we haven't had much luck anywhere else. And so we cooked up the plan to shoot uh, a teaser. And I said, you know, maybe it could be the day before, maybe it could be like the day before the script starts or whatever. You know, these just, just put the three main characters in some wacky scenario and then we'll shoot that. Yeah. What we ended up shooting was the first three pages of the script. And it's it's basically like everything before the title cards, you know? Right. And so we shot that over a weekend in Birmingham, Alabama. And again, Dude. We, the number of stories we could tell about that weekend alone is kind of staggering. <laughs> but uh, we shot in a, in a house that was slated to be demolished by the uh, Birmingham airport. Uh, they Perfect. were expanding. And so we got this house for like free basically to shoot in. Yeah. And uh, we we had it for one weekend only. And like we were, there were moments where we thought we were going to get shut down because we had like live gunfire and stuff going on. We had we had a police officer, but we had live gunfire and all kinds of stuff going on. And I mean, it was about as low budget as you can be while still spending a little bit of money on it. Sure. And um, we ended up with a product and we we shot it at the end of September. And I think that was 2010, I want to say. And then. Barry went back and edited it together and shipped it off to his agency and they sent the script back out. And by the end of December, they had a deal in place. Dude. Yeah. Gotta see it to believe it, I guess. It's it it happened. <laughs> it's in the Dude, books. That's amazing. Yeah. That, see, it that, really it's that spirit, fun. you know, like we're gonna get this done. We're gonna make it. We know what we have. It's that ah, whatever that word is. I just yeah. love it. That gumption. Let's let hey, I love that word. Uh, that yeah. that is it. If if dedication is the word or gumption or or just plain stubbornness, like yeah. we, just, <laughs> we just didn't have it in us not to do it, you know? That's what it's about, man. I when I talked to Yuri Lowenthal, one big thing he talked about was the success of an actor is you know, it, it's talent, it's luck, it's timing, but so much of it is just perseverance. Like if oh you stay gosh. in the game you, long you enough, hear that so often. <laughs> you really like, do. It's it's how it works. You just got just stay in the game. The yeah, that, that is the theme. That is the theme. If you can stay in it long enough and gut it out. And it is, it's, it's heart wrenching. I mean, there's lots of us, myself included, that like you have these lulls and you're like, what mm-hmm. happened? Like I was on top of the world for a moment and then you're, then you're down and you're like, what is going on? Like, I, I can't get hired to save my life. And right. You know, you just got to gut it out and say, Hey, okay, just do the work, focus on the work and you know, it'll, it'll come around or it won't. But like, as long as you're enjoying the process, you're having a good time. Is this is it safe to assume this is around where like your more stunt stuff started happening? Because I know this you doubled is, this Lincoln. Is, this is where stunts started. Yeah. Okay. So okay. so the the story there is uh, <laughs> I I tell my most groan inducing story when I say people say, well, how did you get into stunts? And I say, I fell into it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my dad joke of the day. As you um, do. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, so so it. the original idea was that Clayne would come in and be our our brick duty. And then Griffin was supposed to be uh, McQueen, and then I was Lincoln. That was the way we we had originally intended this to to shoot it when we were going to do it super small budget, you know, credit cards only. Sure. Then when we shot the teaser, Clayne was like, "Hey, I'll get my buddy, you know, Christian, um, who was on Leverage at the time." Perfect. Uh, he was like, "Why don't Why don't I get him to come down and give you a little more star power?" And we were like, "Cool, okay." So I I was still Lincoln at that time, but. Uh, Christian came in as Lincoln and then um, Griffin became this like cousin role and, and uh, Clayne was still our brick. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then by the time it got to the feature film, of course, you know, we didn't have credits, you know, our credit list, my credit list is still short, but it was like two <laughs> at that <Right>. time. <laughs> and people were like, Ooh. <laughs> right. so uh, the producers, you know, at the time it was a bit of a heartbreaker, but you know, now that I know more about, again, the business, this is our education. The business is like, you got to have names right. in to, to put butts in seats, to, to sell tickets, to sure. views, you know? And so, um, you know, the, the cast became what it was. Travis Fimmel became McQueen. Brick, uh, Brick was still uh, Colleen Crawford. And then a guy named Daniel Cudmore was cast as Lincoln. And he, Daniel Cudmore is one of the sweetest human beings alive. He looks like cool. a monster. Yeah. Because he's like 6'8", 6'7", 6'8", Canadian bread, just like he, his brother plays professional rugby for, for Canada. It's like of they, they're, a fam, they're a family of, of thoroughbreds. And, yeah. and he, he is no exception <laughs> to that. But uh, he's a very sweet human being. But he came in to play Lincoln. And of course, as, as I've learned in stunts, it's it's there are not a lot of tall guys. And um, so Lynn Oding, the guy that, that gave me my first stunt job, kind of very – put me in contact with him and was like, Hey, you know, you played Lincoln in the OG in the, in the teaser. Like you, you look like you can handle action. Like have you ever thought about doing stunt work? And I was like, you know, I never really occurred to me. I don't know what's involved. And I was like, you know, I'll give it a shot though. If you, if you have the confidence in me, I'll do it. Yeah. And just so, say yes. Yeah. Just say yes. And so that became, uh, my first stunt job was doubling Lincoln on uh, Baytown Outlaws. Dude. How'd you like it? I loved it. I mean, it definitely appeals to the athlete in me. Um, yeah. I think there are things that like could have probably better prepped me. And, and I, you know, whereas this is where I say like, this is my mea culpa is like, I don't have the same stunt background that a lot of stunt guys do. Sure. I, I did Taekwondo for, you know, a couple, you know, it was really, <laughs> it was like a year, but it was like, it feels right. like it was a blink, you know, like I don't sure. have that same martial arts prowess or parkour or tricking or you right. know, I, I just don't have that background. And so I'm a bit of a dis- at a disadvantage sometimes because there's a learning curve, mm-hmm. but, um, but what I do like and and what I think is, is, is a positive quality about myself is I love learning new things. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I, I, it's hard to talk about yourself, but like, I, I do feel like I'm a pretty hard worker. Like I will give you 110% all the yeah. time. I'm not going to, slack i want to do a good job if anything i'm going to be harder on myself than you are Relatable. so so that's the that's the spirit that i carried into it and you know i do i respect those guys too there's a there's a very healthy oh, yeah. amount of respect on my end for these guys they're like uh, even talking about our friends i mean Stephen O'Young, he's ridiculous a he's handsome but yes yep. but b he's like <laughs> he's an extremely talented actor yeah and to boot he's fantastic like action artist a stunt performer fight coordinator like ridiculous he's, he, he's world class at that level ross that we talked about earlier and you've, you've interviewed yeah i don't need to tell you how good he is at what he does yeah and so a lot of the time in my career i've i just enjoyed the fact that a i get to work with these people yeah and and if there's something to learn like oh my gosh all the better if i can take something away from it other than you know the fact that i got to work with them absolutely that's the goal right it's like when you work with other actors that are really good you have to step your game up and then you get better stunts the same thing if you're working with people that are good you level up just by being in proximity there, yeah, there's the adage, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yes. Um, I, I'm very fortunate. Like I'm the dumbest guy. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes, uh, in speaking in terms of like the physical prowess of like most of the people I work with, I'm the yeah. guy that's like, I'm in the back of the bus. Like help, yeah. guys, help me. <laughs> I always say I, I'm just smart enough not to be a dumbass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I always call myself a clever. I, I'm not smart. I'm clever. Like, yeah, I'll be there like, you oh, go. Yeah, okay, I'll find a way to make it work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Persistence. You just got to keep going. <laughs> there you go. There it is. Got it out. There it comes back around. <laughs> how how long was it after doing like uh, Baytown Outlaws before you ended up on like Bullet to the Head? Uh, pretty short order. Lynn, Lynn Oding, the guy that um, was coordinating uh, – uh, the Baytown Outlaws was working with two other guys. One is Don Don Tirada and another guy named JJ Perry, who is also fantastic and just had his directorial um, cup of tea, let's say, with uh, Day Shift with Jamie Foxx and oh, cool. the Vampire Pig. 
so cool. And he's such a great guy. So I'm, I'm glad to see those guys succeed, but they called me in because again, they, they didn't have too much trouble. Uh, they had a little trouble finding a big guy to double Jason Momoa this time. Now, sure. now I'm going to stop right there and say, I did not double him in the, in the film, <laughs> but, but all stunts generally goes through a phase called previs where you kind of conceptualize the fight choreography and mm-hmm. even, even do some of the like stunt stunts that are involved in the film. And it's kind of a, uh, they call it previs, but it's it's just that it's like all the concept stuff that for, for the stunt coordinator or sometimes second unit director to present to the director for them to say like yeah this works this doesn't work, you know right. it's like the the cheat sheet or the or the rehearsal choreography let's say totally lots of so, boxes yeah yeah lots mm-hmm. of cardboard boxes um and so I was doing the previs as Jason Momoa the the axe fight that they have in the climax nice. of the game. So I did that, and and this obviously bears re- relevance to our to a much later job, but yeah, uh, yeah. this is this laid the groundwork. So working for those guys was really cool. Like, and again, you want to talk about you know those short films being our film school. This was my stunt school. Like a oh, lot of guys wow. who had the martial arts training. Who, if you grew up in Hollywood, like there's wonderful mentors out here that'll teach guys. Even you know teenagers, they'll be doing high falls and. Yeah. Doing all the like practical fire burns and all the like practical stunt things that that most stunt performers do. And I didn't have that um, coming up in, you know, on the East Coast and especially in Alabama. And so this was my stunt school was on set. And, and thank God for, you know, these guys that trusted me and said like, hey, you know, I'm putting my faith in you. Can you do this? And I was just you know, you just got like you said, you just got to gut it out, put your head down and say, yes, sir. And, you know, it, one job led to another. Dude, did that was that squibs? You getting shot a bunch? Oh yeah, yeah. Got cool. got died died. I I'm one of those guys who can say I die for a living. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. pretty good at it these days. It was fun. It, it's great fun. I mean, who doesn't like to play pretend? I mean, that's right? that's all we're doing. We're playing cops and robbers and grown up outfits. Exactly. Who, who doesn't <laughs> want to get shot eight times by Call Drogo? I mean, come Why on. Why not? Why that's, not? That's pretty good. <laughs> it's super fun. <laughs> I'm I'm seeing the thread now though that like. Because you, because you're tall. How tall are you? Six. I'm six four. Six four. Goodness gracious. Mm-hmm. You know, like I say, I, I I I'll be as honest and as blatant as I can in saying that, like, I am often not the most talented guy in the room, but I am a very hardworking guy, uh-huh. and I'm darn lucky for being born tall. And that's just facts. Right. You know, I just got lucky in the lottery there. So <laughs> sure, because you're you're doubling Jason Momoa, and then I know shortly after you were doubling David Harbor. Is that around the equalizer shortly after that? That is, yeah. Yeah. So Antoine Fuqua directed that. And again, Lynn Oding, another another mention for him. He he was still stunt coordinating at the time, second unit directing. And so I got to go up and and be part of the equalizer. Super fun. How was it watching like Denzel and David Harbour go back and forth? Like masterclass, right? The, the funniest thing. So I I can almost i I can manifest it or I can predict that I will be working with David Harbour again. So when I, was in, when I was in New York and I was working, uh, I was like working, waiting tables, you know, just going to acting school, trying to learn something. Yeah. And um, I went to go see a, a, a theater teacher that I had worked with in Alabama, had visited New York, and we went to go see Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And nice. David Harbour was in the play. Dude. And <laughs> it was funny. He was playing Nick. So he was in the play and, you know, think whatever you will of that mm-hmm. years later, I go to work with him on equalizer. And I told him, I was like, Oh, this is really cool. Like I, I told him, I was like, Hey, sir, I don't know. You know, you wouldn't know me obviously, but like I'm doubling you. And I was like a funny story. Like I, I saw you like years ago in, in who's afraid of Virginia Woolf on Broadway. And he was like, Oh, cool. Blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever. So we touched base then. And then uh, many years later, again, now after uh, this is almost present day. Now I saw him in, in London at a, uh, uh, at a convention. And so I talked to him again and it's funny, like I didn't want, I wanted to like pick the right moment. Sure. We, we were sitting at like nearby tables in the, in the green room. He overheard me saying that I had just worked on, you know, uh, Obi-Wan, which is coming mm-hmm. up, I'm sure. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> and, uh, and he had just finished filming uh, violent night, which is now out in theaters, the, the Santa Claus. Uh, yeah. I've heard it's amazing. <laughs> violence pick. And uh, Jojo Eusebio and the stunt team from Obi Wan went on to work on that directly after. So oh, it was a cool. very small world, but we got to reconnect, and I and that's when it dawned on me, like, man, I know I'm going to end up working with this guy again at some point. Yeah, <laughs> but Your it, paths but, are intertwined. Yes, yes, but you know, working with Denzel, or just watching them was that was again, you know, every chance you get 
on set to be around people like that is film school, you know? Yeah. It's acting school, it's stunt school, it's whatever. But like you watch those people just be brilliant <laughs> effortlessly. <Yeah. laughs> and you know you're in the presence of greatness. It's just fun to like be there. Yeah. It's like just you just to be in the presence of that much skill. Absolutely. It's wild. Is it do you see movies differently now because you've been on like set and you see them being made versus what's on the final product? Yeah, there there's a period of that. Um yeah. sometimes yes. Sometimes I'll think about that. Sure. Um there was a period I think when I, you know, once you see the sausage being made, it's like, yes, there was a time where I would think about that constantly while I was watching a movie. Right. And now I've kind of learned to turn it back off a little bit. Like Sure. Enjoy. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I just want to, yeah, I just want to be entertained just like everybody else. <laughs> sure. And uh, the best films are where I don't even have that thought at all or until afterwards. Then I go like, oh, now I will. Like sometimes I'll be like, oh, that was a gnarly stunt or, oh, that fighting is not so good or, you know, whatever. But like, sure. How'd they do that? Yeah. Yeah. how they do that a lot? Or I'll, I'll try to think it up in my mind of how I would do it, you know? So like there's a lot of that that goes on. Sure. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I still like to turn that part of my brain off as well, just as like anybody else and just be entertained. Totally. So, I mean, you, you brought it up, dude. How how did Obi-Wan happen? Because <laughs> it's a masterpiece. Oh, I man. adore it. I can't say thank you enough, but I my little involvement in it, Ooh. but I'll say thank you. Um, the, the, the number of people that went into that project and the passion that went into that project is yeah. staggering in my mind. Um, the the way it happened for me mm-hmm. was Jonathan Eusebio, Jojo, the guy that that, that I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. he was the stunt coordinator. He was working in Germany, um, in Berlin on the Matrix 4. Oh, uh, right on. And they were doing the action sequences. Now, he was working with Don Tirada, who I mentioned earlier, was oh. the the guy that I did the previs with. He was the fight coordinator for Bullet of the Head. Look at this. So, so you're now almost 10 years removed. And Jojo was looking for a big guy who could handle fight choreography. And somehow I don't, I don't even have this footage. So the fact that Don had it was, it's a mirror. It's a mirror. It, it, they're, they're, they're really, you want to talk about luck. Like there's nothing short of a miracle here, but he apparently showed him the footage of our previs from many years ago, like swinging around an ax, trying to pretend like I was like Jason Momoa. Yeah. And, the scary part is somehow that was good enough <laughs> that was when again i was pretty green like i didn't know much at that point so like i don't even know what that axe fight looks like on my end but like i'm sure don had like lots of busted knuckles and stuff because i was a right. <laughs> spastic idiot back then but um but i do so so i got a call uh from his assistant matt emig who oh yeah totally interview because matt's a monster please He's, connect us i'm a big yeah. fan he, him and him and Ross both were their monsters. But anyway, yeah. he, uh, I got a, I got an email saying, Hey, we want you to come like audition for this thing. Like it's got some sword work involved. And, you know, I didn't know what it was at that point, obviously. And so I, I started working on my sword work and kind of getting up to speed on that and was like, cool, I'm ready. Okay. And so I go in and the first couple of times, like it, it wasn't until like maybe the second, first or second, I don't know what, which time it was when they finally said like, well, this is a Star Wars project. And so, you yeah. know, Mama, and I'm freaking out already because I'm like, oh my God, yes, I got, I get to, I'm, I'm practicing Katana, but at the same time, like, this is so cool. Like I get to be a Jedi. I knew that there was some sword work involved. Yeah. And then it was the third or fourth week where they brought out a stack of NDAs and they were just like, okay, from this point on, if you say anything to anybody, we own you. Right. And um, this is your sniper that's dedicated yeah, to exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> and then they brought out a laundry basket with a pair of football shoulder pads with like a curtain stapled to the back. Amazing. And then they had the case with the helmet inside. Dude. And when they opened, even with the shoulder pads, I was like, what is this? Sure. And then when they pulled out the helmet, you know, obviously they had to see if you can fight in a mask, right? Right. That was the whole idea. Totally. But when they brought out Darth Vader's helmet, I mean, my soul Ooh. left my body. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I blacked out for a while. Yeah. Uh, when I came to, I was like, whoa. The and old so, Tom died uh, that day. <laughs> yeah, I died that day. That was the turning point in my life. Yeah. You know, but uh, but yeah, I, I sort of came to and I was like, oh my God, they're I'm auditioning for Darth. And you know, in the moment you're you're freaking out, but at the same time, you're it was really a fake it till you make it moment where I was like, Hey, you gotta get get your stuff together and like 
at least pretend like you've you've been here before, even though you haven't. And right, you know, take some deep breaths and just do do a good job, you know. And again, I this is something I always fall back on is like if you can have a hard work ethic, you know, you see the the meme out there, right, or the adage like hard work trumps talent. And totally. I'm again, I'm probably not the most talented guy with a sword, <laughs> but I will work very hard to be good. Yes. And, and that's what I tried to lay on was like, hey, if I can impress this guy, then he'll take good word back to his his boss. And so Jojo took that back to Deborah Chow. And then eventually they came into the the rehearsal. And what we ended up rehearsing was we did the 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 hallway scene from Rogue One. Sweet. That was sort of the audition piece. Makes and so sense. he sh- he shot it. And and you know, I I owe that guy the world. Like Jojo worked with me for probably five or six weeks before I even saw the director. Wow. And, and was willing to sort of invest that time with me because I think there was at least some debate, and maybe this was just to 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 plant the seed of competition in my head, but there was some debate as like, do we need to go back to England and get, you know, Daniel or Spencer Wilding or one of those guys to, right. to come in and do this stunt work, you know? And I, and he was like, kind of cheerleading me on, like, come on, man, don't make us use this English guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was a weird, like competitive thing that like appeals to my athletic side. Right. You're totally. Like, oh, I'm good enough. I can do it. Yeah. I you know, got this. So, uh, so yeah. So after those many weeks or whatever, it was kind of like, I stepped away and and as the story goes, there's a wonderful story where I went on vacation with uh, my fiance, my now fiance. Yeah, um, congrats. I went on, thank you, went on vacation with Scout and we went to Zion and we Amazing. were at the top of a, one of the trails and I had, you know, we'd packed a little snack bag and everything and we were just going to watch the sunset and hike back down. And so I set my camera up to do one of those Instagram-y like, hey, here's a uh-huh. time-lapse video of us watching the sunset. Yeah. And when I went to get the camera afterwards, it was like paused right at the moment of like sunset, but it didn't finish. And I was like, why did it stop early? And so I look and there's a voicemail from Jojo and it said, I think I still have it, um, but it says, uh, hey, man, showed your stuff to the director. She said, uh, yeah, she says, if you want the gig, it's yours. And I'm like, oh. who, who doesn't Ooh. want that gig? <laughs> so I called him back immediately. And, you know, I'm like shaking, <laughs> calling him back immediately. Like, yes, sir. I'll, uh, whatever you guys need, I'll be back there tonight if you need me to, you know? Yeah. And uh, and the the rest is another long story of history. But yeah, it it that was the kickoff. Oh, I love it. And what? How special is that? That you got the call at a place like that with your now fiance. Like I love stuff like that. The, the, love it. That's that's the stuff that it it just doesn't get any better in my mind. Like yeah. there's no way you could have scripted it to say like if we had just been sitting around the house. You know, it would have been right. Yeah, I was in know, it, it still would have been a great <laughs> call, but like you know, it it just would have had a different context. But the fact that it was in that moment and that it stopped the video <laughs> like yeah. right at sunset and like I mean, come it, on. <laughs> It was just weird, like uncannily weird how that all worked out. And like, I just wouldn't have it any other way. Oh, I'm about it. Like we said, it's it's about the story. It is. And that's that's a so then how did you how did you end up as the alien, the Zabrak with the horns and everything? I think that was another tall guy thing. <laughs> cool. Hey, take him. Take him, Tom. Because <laughs> again, I will reiterate again for all the people listening that I was not the most talented guy in the room. <laughs> the stunt team, the core fight team that we worked with. So, so it was Matt, Matt Emig, who is a just world, again, world-class legendary martial artist and, and the theatricality and the movements that he can do are just like, sometimes you're just like, what? Yeah, and how? then, and, and Ross obviously was doubling you in and he's amazing in his own right. Mm-hmm. And then we had this like cadre of other guys, you know, there was Cena McKenna who was doubling, um, uh-huh. Ingram. Yep. And then we had, uh, the other guys were, were this action team out of Germany called real deal action design. Oh, love and, it. and the guys from Germany, they had done, I, I love these guys for the same spirit, um, that you and I have, have, have that kinship is they had taken uh, their own script, produced it. And made a feature length film very much in the style of like Guy Ritchie. They had this like sort of caper film that they had cool. cooked up. But, uh, but, uh, Chan Iden and, um, Ch- Cha Yoon, who is Donnie Yin's stunt double. Amazing. And then another guy named Fong Jang, who is uh, equally talented. He's a pretty big guy too. He's like over six feet, but the way Dude. he falls is like a, a thing of beauty. And, yeah. <laughs> and I, I relied extremely heavily on these guys. Like they, 
basically molded me from like the the lump of dirt I was into the performer <laughs> I I became. And I, I I I joke, but at the same time, like that's that's in all seriousness, like those guys are world class at what they do. They also are in uh, Violent Night. Those cool. are the guys that went over to Violent Night, and. They're not just stunt guys, though. They're they're filmmakers and they're actors and they're performers. And so they understand a lot of the stuff that like it's not just stunts. You know, there are a lot of stunt guys and this is not to speak ill of anyone, but like there are a lot of stunt guys that just want to do stunts. They totally. Don't, they don't quite get or fully comprehend like the the acting side of it, the performance side of it. Right. And that, again, that's not a knock because these guys are often world class athletes. But like then there are guys that are stunt actors or action actors like these guys that are just phenomenal at what they do and they can act yeah. and so to, to work with them was like then there was a brotherhood there was a kinship there was like a, oh okay we all get it you know so yeah. so it was really an education working with them and i and i do i owe them a lot um all those guys everybody i named and, and those that i didn't name like i owe them so much to to sort of contributing what i was able to bring to the performance oh dude tide raises all ships that's how, you're right. You're like right. Like we said, you know, if you, if you're in the right place with the right people, you can't help but go from you know the clay to the pot. You're 100 right. 100 right. I love that. How long were you in makeup for that? Uh, so the Zabrak, <laughs> that was a whole process into itself, right? Is like, yeah, I had to get the prosthetic made for the head mm -hmm. and all that, and so I I I did that, and then the makeup itself took like four hours, I want to say. I Ooh. think th that was the first time, and then they cut it down from there. But like, yeah. The, the trial run took about four hours and um, that was just icing on the cake. You know, again, it was just being a tall guy and being picked to, to be the right guy for that scene in contrast with Cha. Cha was the, the other guy in the scene fighting you. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he's the guy that's Donnie in stunt double. And like, just like I said, they were like, uh, it was funny because Deborah on the day was like, uh, I remember them saying like, yeah, these guys aren't like soldiers, you know, they're just like thugs. So she was like, Tom, you're doing great. Child, we need you to be a little more sloppy. <laughs> and then I, I laughed so hard because I was like, I love that my technical note is like, you're doing great being sloppy. <laughs> like your fighting looks like you don't know what you're doing. Child, right. we need you to be less technical because you're too good. Uh, you know, like slow down, you're too fast. Um, right. You know, like it was really funny. You look um, like you're and, actually going to hit him. Tom, I don't know what he's doing, but it looks great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you look, yours is awful, but we love it because it works for the scene. Um, <laughs> no, it was really funny. And of course, Ewan was a great sport. He's, he, he outworked all of us. So, you know, I mean, you know yeah, he is. He's every bit of a, you, you want to take a master class in what it means to be an A-list talent. That guy, that guy did it. He showed out. That's cool. Do you ever go home and just be like, I I fought Obi Wan Kenobi today. Just what? Oh, I did. I did it there. I did yeah. it there. <laughs> I did it there. The first time we, we were sparring, you know, we were doing the choreography separately. We were training each hour piece of the choreography. Mm -hmm. um, Matt and Ross would kind of show us, like, hey, okay, Ross would be opposite of you, and then they would do their the the. A and the B side of the fight. And then I would be opposite Matt and we would do the A, B, A and the B. And they were like, okay, Tom, now Tom and you, and you get together and you do it. And I swear the first time I looked at him, he, he like was at performance level or what Dude. I thought was performance level. And like looking into his eyes, I was like, Oh, that's, that's Obi-Wan. Oh <laughs> and God. I sort of lost my place for a second. And I was <laughs> like, okay, can't do that. The boss is watching. Like you got to get your head on. But, uh, <laughs> but it was really funny. Cause I was like, you, you know, it was, it was, it was like, there were times on set and and I, I often tell this story, but there were times on set where like in between setups, you know, a setup is moving the camera, the lights from one spot to another, right. but in between setups, like they would give me a break. So they'd sit me down on an Apple box or a chair and just say like, Hey, here's some water. Like here's a fan, like cool off, whatever. Yeah. And I would just look around at like everybody working and just kind of like, it's like you said, the rising tide. It's like everybody was working so hard that you can't help but put your all into something like, yeah. Cause otherwise like you don't want to be the guy that's like out there slacking. You don't want to totally. be the big guy, whatever that's out there, like bringing everybody else down. I was like, I will take all notes. I will like this thing it, as much as we can dial it in. Like I made myself open to all direction, all notes, all uh, critiques and, 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 you know, constructive thoughts. Like I just wanted to hear what everybody had to say and it was the most gratifying, like, you know, yes, you know, people are kind of drinking their own Kool-Aid at this point, but there were times where like people on set, like it could be like the groundskeeper guy, the guy that would come in with like set decoration or whatever with plants. And he would yeah. walk by and just like whisper to me, like, dude, it looks awesome. 
Uh. <laughs> and, and, and I would really like take that to heart. I was like, yeah, like, there was no fake gratitude there. I was like, oh, I was like on the verge of like tears constantly because I was like such an emotional roller coaster. And and just the energy that I was expounding to like try to be good and and to hear even that was just that's all I needed at some point, some points in the day, that was all I needed just to get through. It's like, okay, they think it looks good. Keep doing it. Keep going, go harder, go faster. You know? Yeah. I, I remember reading this book called the Hagakore a long time ago. And it's like this dude followed this like old Japanese guy and just like wrote down what he said, like wisdom from elders type thing. But a big mm -hmm. thing he talked about was the purpose of friends. And he said that everyone lives their life in the eye of a hurricane. That is their life. It's everything that's going on in and outside of our heads. But our friends are not in the hurricane, so they have a vantage point outside of the chaos in our heads. Mm. So it, it really is. We do need each other in that sort of oh, thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, dude, you're you're Darth Vader. <laughs> you know. Well, <laughs> absolutely. And it's it's you, you know, it's kind of something I mentioned earlier. But like you know, I tend to be my own worst critic, and so there Same were time. times where I would get frustrated. And I remember there was one day where I was like, and I don't remember which part of the fight sequence it was, but you and I were having a hard time getting in sync. And it wasn't mm -hmm. anybody's fault necessarily. It was just like, uh, like at one point the steady cam operator fell over, and at one point sure. like the lightsaber broke, and it was just like different things that like we couldn't find a rhythm. Right. And. I was getting frustrated. I was like, and it was more at myself, like, ah, you know, the helmet, like my helmet came off at some point. Right. And I wasn't, I wasn't really frustrated with the costumers. I was just like, man, we were so close. And now like the one thing is like, we had this take that we had almost worked all the way through and then the helmet fell off. And it was just like, right. come on. Like, so I got frustrated. I remember Fong uh, came over to me and he's, he's like, Hey, he's like, you're, he looked me in the eye and he was like, you're doing great. He's like, don't worry oh. about that stuff. Like that's going to happen. Like do your thing, keep staying sharp. Like make sure you're, you're, in your zone, you know, don't worry about all the outside stuff. Yeah. And, and it was all I needed to recalibrate in that moment. It was the perfect note at the perfect time, you know, like it brought me right back into it where I was like, he's right. Take a couple breaths, focus on the moves, like just make sure that you're being safe and you're, you're keeping you in safe and yourself safe and everything's going to be fine. Oh man. The power of that, right. That just human connection of like, it's all right. It's what, it, ah, I just, I love it. It's the magic yeah. of humanity, stuff like yeah, that. Absolutely. How many episodes did you work on? I, well, I, I mean, I guess in theory, I worked on all six that, that, you know, when you're part of the core team, like you kind of have involvement, even when you're not involved, if you're not on the shooting, sure. day, you're doing previs or whatever. So I was around, you know, the, the same length of time as Ross, right? We started in middle of February or February or so and mm -hmm. went all the way to September. Cool. And um, so I was, I was somehow involved in every, in every uh, episode, but in, in true physical spirit, I think I was in episode two was the fight with the Zabrak. Mm -hmm. And then in episodes three, five, and six were the other fight scenes. Right. So, um, so I, I, of course, shared the role. I mean, obviously, Hayden. Totally. <laughs> Hayden yeah. <is> our <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. uh, a, guy, a guy named Demetrius Pastrewski was. Um, yes. What, I, I don't know how they credit him. I think they call credit him as like suit performer, mm -hmm. uh, Vader or something like that. But he's this equally large guy he's six very tall six six seven i think Ooh. and um big fella but but the body control he has uh yeah. i i always said like we were sides of the same coin like uh hayden of course was our was our godfather he was the og man yes but then demetrius was this like extremely graceful like have you ever seen him he came from the circus world oh i've seen it him like he, balancing he, he while juggling. Like, Headstands, handstands on those uh, those what do they call those boards? The balance boards. Yeah, on like he can a do barrel. A handstand. Yeah, he can do a handstand on a barrel. It's crazy, especially for the size he is. Like it's insane. Yeah. But like he can do handstands and all this kind of like his body control. So so Deborah, you know, her approach was she wanted like this elegant, like uh, royalty sort of a figure. You know. Sure, makes sense. And so, and so we were the opposite sides of that coin. He was the composed elegance of Vader with that ferocity and violence underneath. And then mm -hmm. I was the more unleashed <laughs> yeah. violent side. I feel like that was a little more erratic. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of moved like a, like a gorilla. So I don't think I could uh, <laughs> fit the bill for the grace part of the equation, but uh, right. that's where he, his, his strength showed. So the duality of Vader. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so if you've got the helmet on and you're doing these fight scenes, those scenes were like at night. So how yeah. could you see at all? 
Uh, not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not too no, good. Uh, you, this is where you and gave his master class an understanding as well. Like yeah. uh, the first, the first fight scene that really wasn't much of a fight, but it was that first scene in episode three. Oh, it was incredible. Yeah. It yeah. was a him running. Th- the first shot. Yeah. was him running away basically. But at the time, we, we later figured out that you could remove the lenses. And so when they would shoot like an over the shoulder behind me, oh. we, would, we would take out the little lenses. I would still have to wear the full helmet, which was sure. hard enough. But with the lenses in at night and the wide shot was shot with like a, a condor crane, you know, a big crane sure. and then a light balloon up top that looks a lot like a blimp. Right. Uh-huh. And um, that was the only light in that scene besides our lightsabers. Dude. And Ewan being the, the consummate performer he is and knowing that it was a wide shot, he was really running away. Like he was, he was running uh, some of the times or like really taking the hits and like big reactions, you know, cause again, it was a wide shot. Right. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I just remember the first go through, like I was like chasing, I was having to almost chase after him and it was hard <laughs> because they were like, okay, you got to stay composed and like, make sure your posture is really good and whatever. But I would hit and it, 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 the way I can imagine it is like, you hear the fighter pilots talk about like landing on an aircraft carrier at night. It's just like throw a matchbook in the middle of a room, turn out all the lights and then try to keep your eyes on it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it was kind of the same thing. It was like wear sunglasses, go outside, pitch black at night, and then take a take a fluorescent tube and just wave it in front of your face every now and again. <laughs> and so that's what it looked like to me. It was like I would just see the lightsaber, and when he would take a reaction and he would turn away from me, I would lose him almost completely. Oh, no. And so there were times in that fight sequence and in the final one where like I would just kind of lose him, and I was like. Uh, you know, a silent prayer in my head was like, please don't hit you and McGregor in the head. Please don't hit you right. and McGregor in the head. Right. <laughs> but I think I got his knuckles a couple of times where he was, he, you know, he, he, he winced, but he was a good sport about it. And he was just like, I understand. He was like, you're going through it right now. And I was like, thank you, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but he was very kind about it, but he was, but he was a, a great, great person to, to dance with, as I like to say. That's cool. Is it, does that, is that day the most challenging day you had then? Uh, the, the final fight was the most challenging as as a set of multiple days. I, uh, I lost a lot of weight. (laughs) (laughs) Um, those, those who are uninitiated, uh, I, I have great sympathy and great respect for anybody that's a suit performer, whether it's actor stunt, totally like the, the literal blood, sweat and tears that go into those costumes. I mean, God bless the costumers too, for that matter. But you know, the Darth Vader costume is basically you are clad from head to toe. And I mean, literally in leather. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like a quilted leather suit, Ooh. uh, gloves Weird. and all. And then by the time you get to the helmet, it's like, you know, any heat in your body basically comes out through your neck. And when you uh-huh. put the helmet on, it's basically like you're in a sauna on top of it. Right. So <laughs> there were days where like, I, I, I'm a, I sweat anyway, pretty heavily. Like I cycle fluids pretty good. Uh-huh. And, um, in that suit, it was there, there were definitely like anytime there was a break, I was chugging electrolytes. Um, and then this is true of all the guys that play stor- stormtroopers and stuff too. It's like, mm-hmm. those are, those are not comfortable outfits. Like you Thanks. The stunt guys that are taking wrecks and like anybody that spent time in that costume knows like it is not a picnic. Like it's, it's a struggle what what actually helped was the sweat honestly like when you put first put it on it's like it's kind of like stiff leather you know it's like it, it doesn't really move as freely as you would like sure and so honestly they would be like do you want to take a break do you want to come out of costume and i was like absolutely not because like the more l- sweat i could get in there to sort of lubricate the fabric like it actually helped because then i could actually move around a little better oh so I smart was, I was super happy just to like get suited up, get warm, and then just kind of stay at a certain, like, I didn't want to go too far into the cool down place or else I'm pretty certain I would have been cramping left and right. Sure. And that's why you're a little more malleable. Yeah. But that, but that last fight took two weeks or or about 10 filming days. Really? And I can honestly say like after, like there were days where I was very close to like a breakdown of just like physically, I just couldn't, I was just like, I'm, I'm so gassed at the end of the day. Like, Sure. You know, I was, I was ready to collapse and especially towards the end of the weeks, you know, it was just like, man, I'm like I said, you want to leave. And it it wasn't, that's not to speak ill of the costumers or anybody else or the, the demands demands that were placed on me. It was like, Hey, you know, this is the time where you want to talk about gutting it out. This is the time to do it. Like you owe this to the part, you owe this to the character, you owe this to Hayden, you owe this to all the rest of your stunt team that have helped you out to this point, you owe it to the director you owe it to yourself. And so yeah. 
you know, you just got to kind of take that up and say like, Hey, you signed up for this and PS look at what you get to do. <laughs> so, so quit your complaining and get back to work, you know, like, uh, so, yeah. so, so yeah, I mean, I just took all that and said, you know, just, just put it in, put it in, put it in, put it in. And like, you know, not like it was my role to, to, to act in, but at the same time, I was like, you know, Hayden and I had plenty of chats where I think the way he speaks about the character is like, there's a certain level of brilliance there that people underestimate Yeah, the notes that he took from George Lucas, the notes that he took from Deborah, like that Amazing. desperation that you see in that scene. Like, yes, I, I was like, fine, I'll take that. I'll take all that and I'll throw it right into the performance. So anytime I felt exhausted yes. or at my wits end or physically, like I couldn't go on, like <laughs> the stuff where I fall <laughs> down, I'm not sure that a lot of that was scripted, but yeah. was like, no, that's great. <laughs> I was just exhausted. And like, I was lost my coordination and I was like, some of it, I just fell down. Cause I was like, I can't, like, I can't stand up anymore. Yeah. And, and, but she was like, just keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it. And so, you know, we just did it. And, you know, I think the product speaks for itself. I hope. I agree. You're using it. You're in the moment. It's it's you know what it is. It's real. It's real. Yeah, that's a lot of real. <laughs> For a lot, even if it was unintentional, it was real. We were exhausted yeah. at that point. Do you do you have like a favorite day that you think back on? Like the project, I imagine as a whole, just incredible. But do you have a day that you think, oh, this one in a in a in a sea of amazing, this one stands up just a little bit. My favorite day, well, yes, I think the whole production was my favorite, but the, my, my favorite day was probably like, there was a Saturday we had to work to do some of the stunts and it was nice. some of the stunt, they were pretty like, I mean, you, you've seen the fight, like it's not, they're not particularly like crazy, like they're not like whirly twirly, you're not getting sent hundreds of feet, like the longest, sure. force, that force push was pretty intense, but it was, I thought it was fun. Yeah. But like, after the day was done, there were two two comments made to me. One was by the, the, the stunt, the head rigger who was um, Randy Haney. And he said, he just said, thank you for making it easy for us today. You made us look good. Cool. And then Deborah came up at the end of the day and this was really towards the end of the fight. But like um, she came up and said, like, I know that was a hard day for you. You are an absolute professional. And I really took Ooh. that. Like that was just really nice to hear. Like I, as I said, I'm my own worst critic. And I think sometimes like it probably showed, you know, they're, yeah. they're, she's, it's her job to sort of read people. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes I was a little hard on myself or I was very like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to say I, I have that tall poppy syndrome where you, or imposter syndrome where you don't deserve to be there. But there were definitely times where I felt like, man, there, there are such a wealth of talent in the world. And even on this, this fight team, like, I, I don't know that I'm the, as good as they are, you know? Yeah. And for her to say that, like, it was just a really nice sort of validating moment for somebody to say, like, you did a good job, you know? Yeah. And, and I really took that, like, took that home. That was, that was really nice to hear. And, and I needed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure the exhaustion on my face, she was like, I better say something to him. But, yeah. uh, but no, that was really kind of both of them to sort of say that. And, and Jojo kind of echoed those same sentence, sentiments at the end of the fight. He was like, I know, I know I sort of took a chance on you, but he's like, you delivered and I appreciate it. And so that was, it's just nice to hear like that validation when you do work your butt off and you're trying your hardest, like for somebody to recognize that and say like, Hey, you did a good job, man. Like, thank you. That's, that's really nice to hear. And I'll, I'll never, th there's no amount of gratitude or thank yous I can give back to them. Like I, owe, I owe all those people, my life, my career at this point, like I, I owe that to them and I I'm fully aware of that. So if they ask, I'm, I'm asking how high, you know? Yeah, I love that. It, I mean, your heart's on your sleeve. Yeah, you know, and there's there's yeah. not there's nothing scarier than doing that because it's that risk of vulnerability, right? The more you open, right. the right. more damage you could be. But when you yeah. get acceptance back, it's like, oh, right, this is there's something more than the surface happening right now. You know, right, right, and then there's no bravado to it. Like I said, I owe I owe those people every note they gave me, every performance note they gave me, every technique where they were like, "Be a little sharper here, be a little higher here, be a little lower there." You yeah, know, can you do do your stance different here. You know, anything that they gave. You know, it was one of those environments where, like, I, I think S Stephen O. Young said this too. I'll quote him because he's such a wise man. Yeah, but he said, you know. <laughs> Uh, he when he was working on 47 run and I guess there were three different fight coordinators and it was like best idea wins yeah and there was a, there was a lot of that that went on where it was just like you know there's a point in the fight where you and I go back to back Darth Vader and Obi-Wan go back to back and they're yes. kind of there was a there was an early incarnation of that fight where like nothing really happened it was more or less like he was sneaking behind him to show that like for all of the power that Darth Vader has right he's he's has weaknesses mm -hmm. and 
I think it was Fong that came up and was like, we need to add a little something here. Like, what if he just does like two really quick beats, like a backhand beat and then another beat in between. And it, to me, that's like one of my favorite shots in the entire fight sequence is like, yeah. it's like, bam, 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 bam. And then a spin around and cut over his head again. And he, and he dodges away. And it's like, to me, like that's one of the sharpest beats in the fight. I love it. Cause it's, it's a blind angle for me to swing on and, and thank God Ewan was sharp enough to get under that. But like <laughs> it, it, but, but just that little sequence is so cool to me. And um, I think it adds a lot to the fight. So it's really cool that you get to collaborate with people like that who are world-class in their own right and can lend that expertise and, and just make it better. And and we all do that, right? Like you said, we all kind of one up each other or add a little piece here or there and it, and it provides the ultimate product at the end. Absolutely. I always say that film is the most collaborative art there is. It is. Because it's yeah. everyone doing everything from different, entirely different departments working together to make a final product that could not have been done if one of these things wasn't here. Absolutely. Absolutely true. It's so awesome. So like at this point, do you have like retrospectively any advice for somebody who wants to get into either acting or stunts or both? Uh, it, you know, I, this is where I'll, I'll, I'll just, this is, this is my imposter syndrome on display, but I'll say <laughs> I like, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that I have that right. Um, given that it's, it's my lack of background that some of the stunt performers, like I, I really do. Like I, I hold those guys in extremely high regard because of the talent that they have. Yeah. If you want to get into stunts, absolutely. I would say that like, perfect something. And I, that something can be a lot of different things, right? Parkour, tricking, martial mm -hmm. arts, a particular discipline of martial arts, whatever, like perfect something. And and that's a goal I have just personally, like be, be, be really good at something. Yes. Um, in acting in that regard, I would say like expose yourself to a lot of things and, mm -hmm. and maybe in a, in a more general sense of like life advice, I would say work hard stay humble and be grateful. Like those three things, like I think have done more for my career than anything. Um, sure. It's just, I'm extremely, it, it's not, it's really not lost on me. Like how, how many like great opportunities of, of luck and just sheer timing have come my way. And I'm extremely grateful for those things. And I remind myself often of that. The, the staying humble is like, you know, maybe this is where the imposter syndrome kind of helps is like, I don't, yeah. I like, knowing that, you know, again, we go back to that, like, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. It's like, if you're the most talented guy in the room, maybe it's time to level up or put yourself in a different room, right? It's like, yes. I think that I like being in those rooms where I can learn a lot from the guys because I like to learn and I like to get better. And you're not going to do that if you're playing down, you know? That's true. So, so staying humble is, is kind of easy and it kind of goes hand in hand with the work hard. Like it's, it's that same repeated adage, right? Like hard work trumps talent. Like there can be really talented people out there, but if they don't have a good attitude, uh, they're not grateful or, or they don't care to work on their craft or you know, whatever the mission is at hand, then they're not going to be well liked probably by the people right. around them. And quite frankly, like it's a smaller town than people imagine. So Ooh, for real. You know, like I said, the the the, the ten year journey between bullets to the head previs and the Obi Wan, you know, casting call for somebody to play Darth <laughs> Vader, that, that nobody could have predicted that, and I never could have predicted that. But I just, you know, again, I try to stay humble when you're talking to these guys that are greats, so like these guys that invented the choreography for the original Mortal Kombat, or yeah, did the martial arts film, or fought with Jackie Chan. You know, like some of these guys who have credentials that are way outside of what you see on their IMDb pro page or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It's like you, you, their bona fides are legit and they are, they are real world-class athletes. And, and that is not lost on me. So be humble in the presence of that greatness and, and work hard for them and with them when the time comes. And it's very likely that they will give you something to be grateful for. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love that. And Tom, yeah. just like that, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half. Dude, you survived. I know we got it, man. Yes, it was a pleasure, man. I was looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> almost as much as I was. Now, before I, before I release you back into the wild, I got to ask, where yes, can sir. they find your stuff? Where can people find your, your, your online presence? How can they reiterate my sentiments at how amazing you are? <laughs> well, I appreciate any of that. I, I, uh, I, I'm grateful for all of it on, on Instagram is probably the easiest. I'm not on Facebook and I'm, I'm pretty bad at Instagram to be really honest with you. But, <laughs> um, I was a generation late to the uh, social media party, but, uh, it's, it's Tommy O C T O M M Y O H S E E. And then, um, yeah, just, just keep an eye out. I can't, I can't talk a lot about the things that are coming up, but, uh, 
I, I stayed in the Star Wars universe for a little bit longer. Different character, mind you. Yeah. But, um, I stayed in for a little bit longer, and God willing, they'll have me back for more. So there are things. There are things. Keep their eyes peeled. Keep your eyes <laughs> peeled. Yeah. I love it. And. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, short films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the show, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, and Chris. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.